How old do you think property ownership really is? Do you think it started in the 19th century? How about the 18th century? Many people think it started in the mid 17th century in Europe, but that's all wrong. In reality, property investments started all the way back in the Middle Ages. So how did property ownership and investments even work back then? That's exactly what we're exploring this week. In case you're new here, welcome to History Meets Finance, where we make videos every week about how finance and money was shaped throughout history. So please subscribe if you're not already, but for now let's get back to the topic of medieval property ownership. We often think of the Middle Ages as a bleak, backwards and stagnant period. But in the last three decades or so, this view has drastically changed. In reality, the Middle Ages were a time of great social and economic progress, and we definitely see that in the realm of real estate. There's actually evidence to suggest that successful merchants and the more elite members of society such as lawyers and royal officials, well, they all purchased real estate to establish themselves and their heirs back in the medieval times. In fact, the market was so thriving that it led to one of the most resilient real estate markets in history. Now I know what you're thinking, in the middle ages didn't all the land and property belong to the monarchies? So let's start with medieval Europe. In theory, you're right, the land did belong to the monarch. However, in reality, the kings and queens actually never had absolute control over all land and properties. You see, their power was checked by the very tenants that they leased their lands to, the lords and vassals serving under them. Trying to take away land from them without any valid pretext would end up inviting rebellion. There was an interesting social effect to this as well. Let's say that a king forcibly takes over land from one of his lords without any reason. In that scenario, the others in the king's court would see this as a threat to themselves as well. What's stopping the king from taking the others' lands as well? So this was a delicate balance that kept it all together. And the king had little reason to be hostile in this matter. This meant that the lords had control over their leased property as if it were their own. They'd even pass on their entitlements to their heirs. You see, these lords often subleased their properties to commoners as well. And these commoners also had their property rights protected in a number of ways. First off would be the king's law, which would prevent the lords from arbitrarily moving the commoners from their lands. Now how much this law was in effect is another story, but at least there was this agreement in most cases. And if a lord ever violated these laws, then the king had pre pretext to end the lord's entitlement to the land. But it wasn't just the king keeping the balance of power with the lords. Wealthier commoners or burghers, these were people who were in the upper or middle class and they would consist of merchants and so forth, well they could afford to raise their own private militia should the need arise. So it was in the lord's best interest not to risk embarrassment or to create any form of unrest. And this is why many medieval cities often enjoyed a high degree of autonomy. And this was despite the fact that technically the land it was under was leased from some noble person living far away. So basically, in practice, things were a lot like they are today. As long as you're paying your taxes, you're meeting your obligations, and you're not violating any laws, your entitlement to the land wasn't likely to be threatened. It's good to keep in mind that this only applied to people with some amount of privilege. Either they had money or nobility. And if they had neither, and they were very much in the lower classes of society, or let's say that they were enslaved, property ownership for these folks wouldn't even be a consideration. Alright, so far we've discussed how real estate works worked in medieval Europe. Other parts of the world would have their own unique systems which nevertheless ended up producing very similar outcomes. For instance, in medieval China, you would have the concept of Tiangu and Tianpi rights, and the words roughly translate to subsoil or underground rights and topsoil or aboveground rights respectively. Now Tiangu or subsoil rights meant that people paid taxes and received official documentation from the government and they could claim ownership. However, they had no right to use the land themselves. And the Tianpi or the topsoil rights owners would pay the owners of the subsoil rights owners a fixed rent to use their land. So to make things simpler, a proper translation would probably be landowners and tenants in a sense. Being a landowner in China was very similar to how it is today. You'd have a permanent claim and you'd pay taxes. But one way in which it's different from how it is today is that the landowner was not allowed to work the land themselves. Instead, it was mandatory for them to hire tenants who would then pay a fixed rent for this right. And unlike today, these tenants actually had more rights. They could transfer their title or sublease their rent to others without even asking the landlord's permission. 
Moreover, by law, they weren't required to pay any deposits in advance. It's a pretty well thought out system and tenancy structure considering it was medieval China at the time. Alright, moving on, let's look at the Islamic world, where property rights were based on the Sharia law. This legal framework was actually quite ahead of its time, with individual property rights recognized and various safeguards in place related to inheritance, investments, and financial contracts. However, in practice, the situation was actually no different from feudal Europe. This was due to the presence of the Iqtha system. In it, the Sultan would appoint administrators called Mukta to govern territories, collect taxes, and maintain local militaries. And while ostensibly these were government officials, in reality they behaved like feudal landowners. Their titles got inherited by their heirs and they often charged extra taxes to farmers, pocketing it as rent money to sustain their lavish lifestyles. Now these are obviously very small examples, but it gives you an idea of how things worked back in specific geographies like medieval China, or in the context of specific religions like early Islam. So while this is all very interesting, the question is, who actually invested in properties back then? Regardless of where you happen to live in the Middle Ages, the investment options that were available to you depended on two factors, wealth and status. Servants and other poorer folks would rarely have any opportunity for property ownership, let alone property investments. But if you were a free man and you had more opportunities, then you could enroll yourself in a skilled profession or start a trade. Like today, you could even purchase land far away from where you resided. With that said, property was expensive and to most except the richest, they tended to rent instead. And it goes without saying that entitled lords had the most extensive options because they had both wealth and influence. In many medieval societies, it was not at all uncommon for a lord to hold a rural mansion and an urban townhouse. And then the question comes, how do you transfer the ownership of these properties when the time came? So in terms of property ownership, it was mostly an affair between concerned parties in most developed parts of the world. However, in Europe, Unless you lived in a city, the transfer of property actually involved an extra step. You had to seek the approval of your local lord first, and not wanting to waste a good opportunity, lords would normally exchange a fee for this kind of approval. And this same thing applied if you were a noble yourself. You had to seek approval from an even higher noble, and that higher noble would then have to ask for permission from his liege, and so on until you reach the rank of king. So yeah. The transfer of property titles and land ownership succession was very tricky back then. While on the surface, property rights seems highly restrictive, in reality, the market for real estate was quite thriving. Both wealthy commoners and nobles took part in the sale and purchases of property quite a bit back then. And this form of private land and property ownership helped pave the path for even greater social progress and the rise of a new urban elite, a process that has been continuing since those medieval times. If you like this topic on medieval property investment, you'll really like this video that I made about how banking worked in medieval times. Check it out here and I'll see you on the next one.